Number 10 is mudlarking. Victorian mudlarks are the original foragers of the foreshore. They would be scavenging for anything on exposed riverbed which they could sell in order to survive. This was the last ditch resort. People would hike up trousers and wade their feet around in sludge, feeling with toes as well as fingers for items that may be lost or discarded in the mud. All ages participated in this activity. However, it was usually those who were the most affected by poverty that were taking part. As a result, those seen mudlarking were considered shameful and the lowest of society. River Thames was the most famous for mudlarking in the Victorian era as it was renowned dumping ground that saw endless amounts of product travel through it. It was also a highly impoverished area which made the desperation to make money all the more grand, filling their water banks with the poor. Mudlarking actually isn't out of practice nowadays but it has changed significantly. Nowadays it can be a fun group or solo activity that on occasion does require a permit. You can join mudlarking groups or do tours while traveling. It seems that sifting through garbage was an unfortunate trend in the Victorian era as at number 9 on the countdown is sin eaters. Sin eating is a job that really only affects you if you have a discomfort with death or a religious slash spiritual. It was believed that when someone religious was to die after a life led of sins such as gluttony, lust, pride, or crimes and cruelty towards others, their family would sometimes feel that the only way to guarantee their loved ones access to heaven is through someone living taking on the weight of their sins. While the act is against the church's wishes, sin eaters go back as far as the 70s. 17th century. Depending on the family or the deceased, the meal served may be specific, but traditionally it was just a piece of bread. Placed on the chest of the laid out body, it was believed to supposedly suck up the sins of the dead, clearing them for a passage to heaven. Once the sins had been captured in the bread, the sin eater would sit on a stool facing the door and eat the bread before washing the bread down with a bowl of ale. Because he was a man who would willingly take on the sins of other people, he was often solitary in the community. However, sin eaters fetched a pretty fair price for the act. I mean, if it is true that you're taking on someone else's bad karma, you'd at least want to be compensated for that, right? Sin eating remained popular in England and Wales all the way to the turn of the 20th century when England's last sin eater, Richard Munslow, died in Rattling Hope in 1906. Like sin eaters, our next job was one of public scrutiny and rejection. But number eight in our countdown is the resurrectionists. Money was tight for many, as I had mentioned, but how low are you willing to go as a person to get what you need? Well, if you're willing to dig up somebody's grandma, it could put hundreds in your coin purse. In the early 19th century, the only cadavers available to medical schools and anatomists were that of executed criminals. It was also mandatory for medical students to do an autopsy to graduate and they had to source their own body. This demand for bodies was often unmet, resulting in medical schools and their students offering extreme amounts of money for the delivery of a fresh body. Thus, resurrectionists are born. Sneaking into cemeteries at night, they would prowl around for a fresh grave site and then dig up the recently deceased. However, bodies could only be sold if they were within a certain time period of freshness. And as grave robbing became more common, many family members of the recently deceased would take turns standing guard for nights in a row to ensure that the body lay undisturbed until it was considered unsalvageable for cash. In 1832, the Anatomy Act was imposed due to the actions of William Burke and William Hare, who are believed to have murdered 16 people between 1827 and 1828, just one year, all to sell to the University of Edinburgh. This act did give doctors and anatomists greater access to cadavers and allowed people to leave their bodies to medical science, overall helping end the resurrectionists era. While sourcing the dead may make for a fat paycheck, I think this is a profession nobody should attempt to resurrect. Speaking of the dead, have you ever considered eating off their lap? Okay, well, not quite literally off their lap. Number 7 on the countdown is the cat's meat man or woman. We all know that the Egyptians worship cats, as many cultures do, but did you know that the cat overpopulation in the 1800s London area created a job called cat meat sellers. Always one of the most popular street sellers of the 1800s. If you think they sold cat meat, you're entirely wrong. Don't worry. These vendors were actually selling meat to cats themselves. Primarily horse, it was said that 26,000 horses that were maimed or past their workability were slaughtered a year for London's reportedly 300,000 street cats that were existing in the 1860s. When the cat's meat seller appeared, feline owners were encouraged by their cats mewing to bestow upon their favorite pet a delight full treat for a mere half penny. You may be wondering how this could be one of the worst jobs to have. Well, pushing around a hot stinking cart of horse meat has its cons, such as disease and rot. Depending on where you sold, you could be making a fortune or 
or you could be barely scraping by. The hungry and homeless would often follow, harass, and sometimes burglarize cat meat sellers for meat or money. Also, their stalking behavior did scare off clientele or drew more complaints from the commoners. Personally, I couldn't think of something cuter than a little trolley going around town delivering food to kittens. Prepare to go downhill, however, because this next job is a lot less lighthearted than cat meat delivery. Toshers make number six in our countdown. Toshers, a fun word to say, the job, not so much. Unlike mudlarking, which was in the riverbeds, these workers went underground for their winnings. The Victorian era saw the development of sewer systems, and the poor saw opportunity in them. Toshers descended into the sewers to sift through raw sewage and find any valuable that may have fallen down the drains. It was extremely dangerous work, as noxious gas fumes formed deadly airless pockets, and since sewers were newer, the tunnels frequently crumbled from inefficient building. There were swarms of rats that had little fear of humans, and at any moment, the sluices might just open for a fresh wave of filthy water and feces to come crashing through. After 1840, it did become illegal to enter the sewers without permission. Rather than abandon the trade, Toshers began working late at night or early in the morning to avoid detection. It may have been a stinky job, but it was also one of the most profitable on our list today. I guess you'd go nose blind after a little bit. Right? Hopefully. On a warm summer day, the last thing you want after jumping into the lake on your cabin trip is to emerge covered in leeches. However, in the Victorian era, that would be a prime location for the leech collectors, which are coming in at number five on our worst jobs countdown. Leeches are nowadays seen as little more than slimy and creepy creatures, but believe it or not, they used to be a valuable commodity in the fields of beauty and medicines. This job was often fulfilled by poor women living in the country and farmland regions. Wearing shorts or hefting up their long skirt, these women would wade into dirty ponds and waterbeds alike with exposed legs so as to tempt the leeches. When enough leeches were attached to them, the women would climb back out of the pool and scrape the bloodsuckers into metal pots and bowls. Seeing as leeches can survive up to a year without food or in their natural environment, this wasn't always a profitable trade unless you could find someone in dire or consistent need of leeches. Doctors did use leeches to aid in the caring process of all sorts of conditions, ranging from a stomach ache to joint pain to female hysteria, if you know what I'm talking about. Despite being used in medicine, leech collection posed major threats of deadly diseases and blood loss to their collectors. Suffice to say, I don't think I have any interest in going to a doctor's office if I'm going to be prescribed a leeching. Being given the duty of helping prevent and stop the spread of disease in your community would be an incredibly high honor, but maybe wait to sign that job contract until you hear the details. Nightmen definitely make it into our worst jobs countdown, taking the place at number 4. These men would wander the streets at night working what may be one of the most revolting jobs imaginable collecting human feces off the street for proper disposal. They would dig up the feces from chamber pots, street wells, ditches, sewer holes, you name it. By the time the sun would begin to rise, the carts would be full of the city's excrement, which would then be carried off and reused as fertilizers for the crop that they later consumed. Yummy. Part of being one of the only people up at night means you're a valuable set of eyes. There are reports of nightmen catching burglars or SA in the act, or being called to bloody scenes by members of the public to provide alibis. There's also hundreds of cases where nightmen are the ones to find bodies of those who had met their ends out on the street. After a long, solitary nights of collecting feces and seeing these crimes unfold, a nightman would collect his 23 shillings, which is $75 today, at the end of the week and go home to rest before starting it all over again. Since we're already discussing dung, let's get this next one out of the way because it somehow may genuinely be a little bit worse than the last. At number three, this is the Pure Finders. Please do not be deceived by the name because this job is anything but pure. In the Victorian era, tanners, who are leather workers, would use dog dung in their practice. Referred to as pure for how it purified the leather and ensured its soft flexibility, dog dung became a hot commodity due to the Victorian demand for leather. Leather was being used for just about anything as it was the hottest trend of this era. It was also being used for things like tack for horses and the necessary creation of shoes and books. To meet demands, tanners needed more dog dung, and so pure finding became a career. These finders would go deep into the cities and their sewers, trying to find where stray dog packs amassed so they could score the biggest load. Whenever dung was found, it'd be retrieved and placed into a covered bucket that would later be sold to a tanner. To make it a little worse for you guys, only some collectors wore a glove to protect 
protect their dung handling hand. But others considered it harder to keep a glove clean than a hand, and they opted out of the protection altogether. Yeah, think about that one. I feel like if this next job didn't exist, then maybe we wouldn't have needed the cat meat sellers from our first point in the countdown. Considered one of the most disease riddled jobs of the Victorian era, it's rat catchers coming in second on our list today. The government was smart. It knew its people were suffering and that many were starving and struggling to make ends meet. So they issued a statement willing to pay people to deal with the rat infestations. Every rat would earn people a little extra cash. If someone could catch more than 5,000 rats in a year, they'd earn special privileges. While 5,000 sounds like it would be a lot, it's essentially 13 per day. And it only takes 21 to 23 days for a rat to give birth to its litter. I think you can do the math. It's said that the government's encouragement of rat catching in this time was the stepping stones towards more plague and diseases to come. As desperate poverty driven people made poor attempts to catch these rats and caught the illnesses from them. Others cheated the rules. Some people actually intentionally bred rat colonies to supplement their captured rodents. Rat catching became such a lucrative business that formed around it. And murders even took place when the cheaters were discovered or if somebody infiltrated somebody else's ratting territory. Between the venomous competition and high risk of disease resulting in death, it's safe to say that rat catching may have been one of the worst jobs. And now, what may be the worst of the worst for number one slot, let's learn about the history of matchmakers. No, this isn't the romantic kind of matchmaking unfortunately, but it's rather the business of matches itself. Working what was often a 14 hour shift, matchmakers were predominantly women who were immigrants, living in poverty, widowed, just overall in a bad situation for an era where women had pretty much zero rights. They were compensated poorly, often sexually or assaulted by their management, and even forced to pay fines to their workplace should they be tardy or damage anything they worked on. Working with white phosphorus, the material found in the tip of the match to enable the instant strike anywhere effect, was highly toxic and responsible for a devastating disease known as Fossy Jaw. This nickname was given by the matchmakers to the particularly nasty condition that would cause the jawbone to rot and become disfigured. Eventually this infection would spread to the brain and cause debilitating symptoms and extreme pain prior to death. Should the jawbone be removed in time, some women were able to survive longer with the condition, but nothing was guaranteed once Fossy Jaw had set in. Famously, an article written by a matchstick girl named Annie Besant exposed the conditions of matchstick companies in London. Infuriated, the factory owners fired her and attempted to force signatures of their other staff, stating that they were happy with their working lives. Refusing to do so, by the end of day, 1400 women had gone out on strike. Their demands were eventually Met, but only 20 years later. It wasn't until 1906 that white phosphorus was made illegal in the use of matchsticks in the UK. The matchstick girls were a revolutionary step towards the deliverance of women's right and autonomy, a journey that we're still on today. Number 10 on the countdown is the cat's meat man or woman. We all know that the Egyptians worship cats, as many cultures do. But did you know that the cat overpopulation in the 1800s London area created a job called cat meat sellers? Always one of the most popular street sellers of the 18th if you think they sold cat meat, you're entirely wrong. Don't worry. These vendors were actually selling meat to cats themselves. Primarily horse, it was said that 26,000 horses that were maimed or past their workability were slaughtered a year for London's reportedly 300,000 street cats that were existing in the 1860s. When the cat's meat seller appeared, feline owners were encouraged by their cats mewing to bestow upon their favorite pet a delectable treat for a mere half penny. You may be wondering how this could be one of the worst jobs to have. Well, pushing around a hot stinking cart of horse meat has its cons, such as disease and rot. Depending on where you sold, you could be making a fortune or you could be barely scraping by. The hungry and homeless would often follow, harass, and sometimes burglarize cat meat sellers for meat or money. Also, their stalking behavior did scare off clientele or drew more complaints from the commoners. Personally, I couldn't think of something cuter than a little trolley going around town delivering food to kittens. Prepare to go downhill, however, because this next job is a lot less lighthearted than cat meat delivery. At number 9 in our countdown is the resurrectionists. Money was tight for many as I had mentioned, but how low are you willing to go as a person to get what you need? Well, if you're willing to dig up somebody's grandma, it could put hundreds in your coin purse. In the early 19th century, the only cadavers available to medical schools and anatomists were that of executed criminals. It was also mandatory for medical students to do an autopsy to graduate and they had to source their own body. This demand for bodies was often unmet, resulting in medical schools and their students offering 
offering extreme amounts of money for the delivery of a fresh body. Thus, resurrectionists are born. Sneaking into cemeteries at night, they would prowl around for a fresh grave site and then dig up the recently deceased. However, bodies could only be sold if they were within a certain time period of freshness. And as grave robbing became more common, many family members of the recently deceased would take turns standing guard for nights in a row to ensure that the body lay undisturbed until it was considered unsalvageable for cash. In 1832, the Anatomy Act was imposed due to the actions of William Burke and William Hare, who are believed to have murdered 16 people between 1827 and 1828, just one year, all to sell to the University of Edinburgh. This act did give doctors and anatomists greater access to cadavers and allowed people to leave their bodies to medical science, overall helping end the resurrectionists era. While sourcing the dead may make for a fat paycheck, I think this is a profession nobody should attempt to resurrect. Speaking of the dead, have you ever considered eating off their lap? Okay, well, not quite literally off their lap, but number eight on the countdown is sin eaters. Sin eating is a job that really only affects you if you have a discomfort with death or a religious slash spiritual. It was believed that when someone religious was to die after a life led of sins, such as gluttony, lust, pride, or crimes and cruelty towards others, their family would sometimes feel that the only way to guarantee their loved ones access to heaven is through someone living taking on the weight of their sins. While the act is against the church's wishes, sin eaters go back as far as the 17th century. Depending on the family or the deceased, the meal served may be specific, but traditionally it was just a piece of bread. Placed on the chest of the laid out body, it was believed to supposedly suck up the sins of the dead, clearing them for a passage to heaven. Once the sins had been captured in the bread, the sin eater would sit on a stool facing the door and eat the bread before washing the bread down with a bowl of ale. Because he was a man who would willingly take on the sins of other people, he was often solitary in the community. However, sin eaters fetched a pretty fair price for the act. I mean, if it is true that you're taking on someone else's bad karma, you'd at least want to be compensated for that, right? Sin eating remained popular in England and Wales all the way to the turn of the 20th century when England's last sin eater, Richard Munslow, died in Rattling Hope in 1906. Like sin eaters, our next job was one of public scrutiny and rejection. Number seven is mudlarking. Victorian mudlarks are the original foragers of the foreshore. They would be scavenging for anything on exposed riverbed, which they could sell in order to survive. This was the last ditch resort. People would hike up trousers and wade their feet around in sludge, feeling with toes as well as fingers for items that may be lost or discarded in the mud. All ages participated in this activity. However, it was usually those who were the most affected by poverty that were taking part. As a result, those seen mudlarking were considered shameful and the lowest of society. River Thames was the most famous for mudlarking in the Victorian era, as it was renowned dumping ground that saw endless amounts of product travel through. It. it was also a highly impoverished area, which made the desperation to make money all the more grand, filling their water banks with the poor. Mudlarking actually isn't out of practice nowadays, but it has changed significantly. Nowadays it can be a fun group or solo activity that on occasion does require a permit. You can join mudlarking groups or do tours while traveling. It seems that sifting through garbage was an unfortunate trend in the Victorian era as toshers make number six in our countdown. Toshers, a fun word to say, the job, not so much. Unlike mudlarking, which was in the riverbeds, these workers went underground for their winnings. The Victorian era saw the development of sewer systems, and the poor saw opportunity in them. Toshers descended into the sewers to sift through raw sewage and find any valuable that may have fallen down the drains. It was extremely dangerous work, as noxious gas fumes formed deadly airless pockets, and since sewers were newer, the tunnels frequently crumbled from inefficient building. There were swarms of rats that had little fear of humans, and at any moment, the sluices might just open for a fresh wave of filthy water and feces to come crashing through. After 1840, it did become illegal to enter the sewers without permission. Rather than abandon the trade, toshers began working late at night or early in the morning to avoid detection. It may have been a stinky job, but it was also one of the most profitable on our list today. I guess you'd go nose blind after a little bit. Right? Hopefully. On a warm summer day, the last thing you want after jumping into the lake on your cabin trip is to emerge covered in leeches. However, in the Victorian era, that would be a prime location for the leech collectors, which are coming in at number five on our worst jobs countdown. Leeches are nowadays seen as little more than slimy and creepy creatures, but believe it or not, they used to be a valuable commodity in the fields of beauty and medicines. This job was often fulfilled by poor women living in the country and farmland regions. Wearing shorts or hefting up their long skirt, these women 
would wade into dirty ponds and waterbeds alike with exposed legs so as to tempt the leeches. When enough leeches were attached to them, the women would climb back out of the pool and scrape the blood suckers into metal pots and bowls. Seeing as leeches can survive up to a year without food or in their natural environment, this wasn't always a profitable trade unless you could find someone dire or consistent need of leeches. Doctors did use leeches to aid in the caring process of all sorts of conditions, ranging from a stomach ache to joint pain to female hysteria, if you know what I'm talking about. Despite being used in medicine, leech collection posed major threats of deadly diseases and blood loss to their collectors. Suffice to say, I don't think I have any interest in going to a doctor's office if I'm going to be prescribed a leeching. Being given the duty of helping prevent and stop the spread of disease in your community would be an incredibly high honor, but maybe wait to sign that job contract until you hear the details. Nightmen definitely make it into our worst jobs countdown, taking the place at number 4. These men would wander the streets at night working what may be one of the most revolting jobs imaginable, collecting human feces off the street for proper disposal. They would dig up the feces from chamber pots, street wells, ditches, sewer holes, you name it. By the time the sun would begin to rise, the carts would be full of the city's excrement, which would then be carried off and reused as fertilizers for the crop that they later consumed. Yummy. Part of being one of the only people up at night means you're a valuable set of eyes. There are reports of nightmen catching burglars or SA in the act, or being called to bloody scenes by members of the public to provide alibis. There's also hundreds of cases where nightmen are the ones to find bodies of those who had met their ends out on the street. After a long, solitary nights of collecting feces and seeing these crimes unfold, a nightman would collect his 23 shillings, which is $75 today, at the end of the week and go home to rest before starting it all over again. Since we're already discussing dung, let's get this next one out of the way because it somehow may genuinely be a little bit worse than the last. At number 3, this is the Pure Finders. Please do not be deceived by the name because this job is anything but pure. In the Victorian era, tanners, who are leather workers, would use dog dung in their practice. Referred to as pure for how it purified the leather and ensured its soft flexibility, dog dung became a hot commodity due to the Victorian demand for leather. Leather was being used for just about anything as it was the hottest trend of this era. It was also being used for things like tack for horses and the necessary creation of shoes and books. To meet demands, tanners needed more dog dung, and so pure finding became a career. These finders would go deep into the cities and their sewers, trying to find where stray dog packs amassed so they could score the biggest load. Whenever dung was found, it'd be retrieved and placed into a covered bucket that would later be sold to a tanner. To make it a little worse for you guys, only some collectors wore a glove to protect their dung handling hand. But others considered it harder to keep a glove clean than a hand and they opted out of the protection altogether. Yeah, think about that one. I feel like if this next job didn't exist, then maybe we wouldn't have needed the cat meat sellers from our first point in the countdown. Considered one of the most disease riddled jobs of the Victorian era, it's rat catchers coming in second on our list today. The government was smart. It knew its people were suffering and that many were starving and struggling to make ends meet. So they issued a statement willing to pay people to deal with the rat infestations. Every rat would earn people a little extra cash. If someone could catch more than 5,000 rats in a year, they'd earn special privileges. While 5,000 sounds like it would be a lot, it's essentially 13 per day, and it only takes 21 to 23 days for a rat to give birth to its litter. I think you can do the math. It's said that the government's encouragement of rat catching in this time was the stepping stones towards more plague and diseases to come, as desperate poverty driven people made poor attempts to catch these rats and caught the illnesses from them. Others cheated the rules. Some people actually intentionally bred rat colonies to supplement their captured rodents. Rat catching became such a lucrative business that gangs formed around it. And murders even took place when the cheaters were discovered or if somebody infiltrated somebody else's ratting territory. Between the venomous competition and high risk of disease resulting in death, it's safe to say that rat catching may have been one of the worst jobs. And now, what may be the worst of the worst for number one slot, let's learn about the history of matchmakers. No, this isn't the romantic kind of matchmaking unfortunately, but it's rather the business of matches itself. Working what was often a 14 hour shift, matchmakers were predominantly women who were immigrants, living in poverty, widowed, just overall in a bad situation for an era where women had pretty much zero rights. They were compensated poorly, often sexually 
faster assaulted by their management, and even forced to pay fines to their workplace should they be tardy or damage anything they worked on. Working with white phosphorus, the material found in the tip of the match to enable the instant strike anywhere effect, was highly toxic and responsible for a devastating disease known as Fossy Jaw. This nickname was given by the matchmakers to the particularly nasty condition that would cause the jawbone to rot and become disfigured. Eventually this infection would spread to the brain and cause debilitating symptoms and extreme pain prior to death. Should the jawbone be removed in time, some women were able to survive longer with the condition, but nothing was guaranteed once Fossy Jaw had set in. Famously, an article written by a matchstick girl named Annie Besant exposed the conditions of matchstick companies in London. Infuriated, the factory owners fired her and attempted to force signatures of their other staff, stating that they were happy with their working lives. Refusing to do so, by the end of day, 1400 women had gone out on strike. Their demands were eventually met, but only 20 years later. It wasn't until 1906 that white phosphorus was made illegal in the use of matchsticks in the UK. The matchstick girls were a revolutionary step towards the deliverance of women's right and autonomy, a journey that we're still on today. Kicking off the list at number 10, skincare routines. For a long time now, having pale skin in Europe meant that you were among the wealthy because in the 17th and 18th century, this suggested you could enjoy the indoors. You didn't get sunburns working outside all day, AKA wealth. Keep in mind, this was long before sunscreen was ever even a thing. So at the time, the best thing to wash your face with was something called chemical wash. That was a mighty wash. This thing packed a punch, that's for sure. This wash would ideally get rid of sunburns, pimples, ringworms, smallpox, scurf, or morphew. I don't even know what scurf is, but it sounds awful. I don't want it. And your skin afterwards would be pale and literally glowing. Thing is, all these foundations were made with old timey, horrible, poisonous recipes. One of these facial creams, I swear, I'm not making it up, was literally this. Steep the lead in a pot of vinegar and rest it in a bed of horse manure for at least three weeks. What? I'm trying to get rid of bags under my eyes. How am I supposed to steep lead? What am I, Walter White? I don't know how to steep lead. I can barely steep tea, let alone lead. Moving on, I'm upset. Number nine, mouse skin eyebrows. Okay, Stuart Little, if you're watching this, skip to number six. You don't wanna see any of this, all right? Trust me, it's not good. Back in the 1800s, as I mentioned earlier, the cosmetic game was harsh, to say the least. The eyebrows too, they had a rough go. Eyebrows were completely plucked off back then in order to make the forehead bigger. Yeah, you need that 1800s five head. That's the trick, apparently. Imagine if I shaved my eyebrows off and then painted my face like pale white. Honestly, I'd do it for the clicks. I'd do it for you guys. This five head look didn't last forever, thankfully, but for a hot minute, it almost got worse. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, these leading ladies would shave off their eyebrows and then they would glue on mouse skin to replace them like a band-aid, only horrible and stinky. Since their face was freshly painted and the glue game was weak, they would have one shot only to stick these puppies on. You just gotta eyeball it and hope that it works and that it looks in the right spot, I don't know. You put them on too low, you're gonna look upset all day long. Eyebrows are angry sisters, not angry twins, okay? Remember, number eight, lip paint. Red lips always lie, especially when you don't know that ammonia is mixed in with it. How jolly. Back in the Victorian era, the pale look, red lips, beauty marks, you were trying to look like a literal queen. That was the whole point. So women of the 1800s would either make their own compound themselves, which didn't work, obviously, or if they had some money, they would buy some. The main ingredient in these days were not ideal. Crushed up insects, which already could cause allergic reactions when applied to your lips, but the ammonia mixed in really put the nail in the coffin at that point. Ammonia and crushed bugs? What am I, oogie boogie? What am I making here? What am I plot? Number seven, natural or painted. Today the internet is full of makeup tutorials in every corner. Doesn't matter what style you're looking for, help is now available. You can learn how to draw on eyebrows while listening to a true crime story. You know what I'm saying? It's perfect. The makeup game is crazy, but back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. You had the painted look or the natural look. Natural was light on the makeup, more of a paste look than anything, almost like you're a Victorian painting, you know? One of those? But to achieve the lighter look, Europeans would use actual paint, like paint paint. Just lead-based paint. And the most important part of applying this is that you can't smile. You can't even move at all. Any emotion will cause the paint to literally crack. Again, that's why all these paintings are so serious. 
Madame X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avegno Goutreau, originally painted back in 1884. At first, Sargent made the woman's strap slipping off her shoulder. That was a little, you know, scandalous, a little oopsies. That was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around him back in the 1800s. So John had to literally repaint these straps back on. Yeah, backlash was so strong, John had to move after he sold the painting. The guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. What a nightmare. But this is what I'm talking about. You start drawing veins on pale skin, people would lose their mind. Love that pale veininess for that. Number six, beauty patches. 1800s beauty patches came in many different shapes and sizes. Take this portrait from 1755, for example. Joshua Reynolds painted Charles the Ninth, Lord Cathcart, rocking a pretty large beauty patch. The guy literally looks like the rapper Nelly. That's massive, it looks like a band-aid on his cheek. Whereas other fabrics used in the 18th century were much smaller. They were tiny circles, hearts, stars. If you found this, you'd think somebody was gearing up to go to an Arctic Monkeys concert. They were often used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue. Now the patches were dark black to make the pale pop, but the location of where these went also had purpose. A beauty patch in the corner of your eye meant that you had a lot of passion. On the forehead, that was meant to be majestic. And a dimple patch, oh, well, you're a cheeky one. That's uh, the scandalous one you are. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took notes on these positions when observing two parties from the 1800s. One party had patches on the right side of their face and the other had the opposite. That's like switching jerseys back in the 1800s. You're like, ah, this team sucks. Fine. Number five, corsets. I can't even imagine how hard it was to wear one of these. Like, I have no chest. I'm just a diving board. And already, this is a nightmare. I can't even imagine. The Victorian corset, okay. <gasps> Tiny waist, curves, look, the whole thing. Obviously, this was horrible for your body. Just looking at this, you're like, ugh. Your ribs would literally slowly deform, as well as your spine misaligning. But instead of talking about how horrible this obvious one was, let's talk about that corset duel from 1836. Yeah, have you heard about this? That's a real thing. Hungarian princess Pauline von Maternick was married to Prince Clemens. She had to marry her uncle when she was 20 back in the 1850s, so surprise, surprise, she was a little unhappy. Weird, right? So since the marriage began, her husband, he was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, whatever. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun in life. Then he's like, ugh, what are you doing? Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she defied convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess, to a duel in nothing but a corset. How badass is that? To this day, it's not yet determined who won, per se, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks? Yeah, that should be a musical. Forget Frozen. I wanna watch this on DVD, let's go. Number four, Deadly Nightshade. Macbeth's soldiers used Deadly Nightshade to poison their enemies. And during the Victorian age, women would apply Nightshade to their eyes, just so they look nice. Awesome, so this is horrible, let's talk about it. The pupils would become larger after this, okay? That was the whole point of putting poison in your eyeballs. The thing that makes Deadly Nightshade so commonly known is the sweetness of the berries. Have you ever been outside and you see a berry and like 30% of you really wants to eat that berry? Well, curiosity kills. Deadly Nightshade can be found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. It grows purple flowers in groups of three, along with those inviting purple berries. Just two to four berries can kill a human being, so don't, when in doubt, just don't eat them. And the flower as well, don't ingest this, you'll get poisoned. And also, don't put any near your eyeballs, in this century or the next. Number three, bustles. So while corsets are one nightmare, bustles are just an entirely new thing. Tiny waist wasn't enough, eh? Had to get big old dump trucks as well. These Victorian folks went hard in the paint, figuratively and literally, I guess. Bustles were also known as the Grecian bend. Big old booty bend, that's it. It came to town in the 1870s and it took the idea of wearing a cage as a skirt to just having the back part extend out. Ah yes, an update, an upgrade, I guess. Then the fabric was draped behind the butt. Hope you don't like sitting down ever because that's obviously not an option. Corsets would move your organs around slowly and bustles would slowly damage your back. So let's leave this one in the 1800s. I think that's probably for the best. Number two, red lead redemption. Look, I'm pretty new to skincare routines, but I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to get rid of these bags under my eyes. I'm trying to sleep and drink water, all that jazz. Back in the 18th century, those bags under your eyes were a lot harder to get rid of. 
Lead mixed with vinegar, this would make you look more pale. If I used this, I would literally be a ghost. I would just be invisible. I would, you would just hear a voice in a green screen right now. In the 18th century, that pale look was ideal, but this lead vinegar mix also smoothed out your face. So, what could go wrong, right? Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and arsenic. Those powerful three things you don't want anywhere near your face. Yeah, arsenic too, the same deadly poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. Just the worst ingredients in the 1800s cosmetics game, really. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has arsenic on its priority list of hazardous substances. Toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing today in this century, so I hope this is eye-opening. Sans poison eye drops, I hope it's eye-opening. And finally, coming in at number one, deodorant. What did people even do before Old Spice? You know, before that guy was born, how did we know how to smell good? What did we know how to do? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s, and it was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide, and it was stored in metal cold containers. That's just not, nothing like speed stick at all. It's not discreet in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't long until the first antiperspirant came along right after it. It was called Everdry, and it was always damp, ironically, and it would always burn your underarms. It literally would eat through your clothes. I think at that point, I'd rather smell bad. Like, let me have rashes, let my face look horrible, let the bags show. I don't, I'd rather do all that than any of this. This is horrible. Number 10, knocker upper. All right, sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now, take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. What does that look like? What does that sound like, rather? at 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now, going from house to house, using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10, for sure, it's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so, you know, I'm sure the Knocker Upper came around today, be a little different, they'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker Uppers back in the day, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost $14, thank you. It was a big deal, it was definitely a big deal. Number nine, the Linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you'd probably get lost. Because, yeah, even London now would get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets, and then you'd do it, I guess? It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel. It's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other. That doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. Get to step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker man, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous linker men, famous linker mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there are people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns. That's what I did. The camera, of course, was a hot new invention back then. So tales of ghost and spirit were easily believed, especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tail for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like, that's that's mom. That's definitely not, you just did that in the back room. That's, I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can we pick a lane? Science or not? What are we doing here? Number seven, grave designs. Graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. 
That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting. Well, they know that something's up and they can get them out. But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. The special door would reveal a layer of glass. Yeah, so if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit. Just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin, that's disgusting. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously you know what's gonna happen with the name the rat catcher. It's gonna make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats and I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know, let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England, they were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's gotta do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. I mean, of course, brave souls. And they were highly praised in society, but the job, obviously, wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. You have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now. Not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 18. 1926. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white phosphorus, which is, of course, extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was, of course, done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this, and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, they did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus the entire shift. History is horrible. Number four, resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study her? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's great. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck. It sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. 
Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve, you know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that, imagine me doing this all day. No way, I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, funeral mute. Ah uh, yes, death. Happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know, don't drop them, hmm? all that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Oliver Twist is like, this one sucks, one really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. Just embrace it, you have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victoria, London too, you're gonna breathe in a fresh rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you're uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men, guys. I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? You could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya, just moonwalk out of there. I'm not cleaning anything, just the kitchen for now. I'm not using that tiny little brush. Why do all chimney sweeps have a tiny brush? Give them a bigger brush, you know? Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy of the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a post mortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on, send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting, fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible life. Number eight. The Great Famine. We're gonna lean out a wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number seven, quick divorce. 
Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857, and it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife. How horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change? Hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number six, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> pissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So, dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally, and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home, and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially, all of these cats. Like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? That's number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you, in turn, have to, you can't move. Just where you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, Ah, oh, man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot, of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out, wasn't that great, not that safe. RuPaul's drag race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles, horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic, the same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte, so not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard it before is Awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up. I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then. But this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision. You know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. 
Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Theodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel, this is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so she's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic is not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841, Edward Jones, AKA Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew a route in. So he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff, it was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually, and thankfully, he got caught. Of all the things you can do, of all the crimes you want to commit in the Victorian era, you're gonna go hide under a couch for five years? Okay, I'm glad he got caught, but just so weird. What a weird ending. Kicking off the list at number 10, dark dining. I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like. I have a thing, I have to just, I'm not blindly, what if it's not cooked, I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night, it was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch, kill the light. <laughs> what, how do you like your eggs? Turn off the light, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Number nine, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. Two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover, it read, a 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s, but this case, was odd, everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem, and lo and behold, they found a two pound, solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds, that's what happened. That's how she 
met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time, I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number eight, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. Historical, definitely. Messed up, absolutely. Number seven, Saved by the Bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend. The safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we had the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, one, that would be so scary, but if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437 was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an approved burial case, a real patent. This was a real coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting out. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. Like a walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number six, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more. I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device O-Life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass passively come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. Number five, Queen Victoria's name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks, then we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system. That was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day. Yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. It's not so good with needles, you know? I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, I have a little scar there. 
not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well, if he has a sleeve, well, then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really. It was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're going to try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. Number three, gym day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. So you're like, what? what's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that, okay? It's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those, definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. How to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849 and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister and at the age of 22 he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far, so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone so we can listen together and then we can decide if we hate the album. That's creepy, I wouldn't do this. Would you want this? Sound off below if you'd want, you know, big shiny tunes playing for eternity after you die. I would do the Titanic theme song, just make everyone so sad all the time. Number 10, Albert. Adam, how is Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert bizarre? Well, my little honeybees, not to be a pessimist, but it's bizarre because they actually really did love each other. Uh? Be honest, how often do you think it occurred that people of royal or noble birth actually got to marry someone they genuinely loved? On February 10th, 1840, Queen Victoria married Prince Albert of saxe coburg gotha who, interestingly, was her first cousin and who was actually kind of not the favorite of the British people who saw him as an outsider. As queen, she was the one to propose. Good for you, Queen. Literally. The couple stayed married for 21 years until Albert died of typhoid in 1861. And together, the couple had nine children. Nine. Even after his death, Queen Victoria continued to make ruling decisions based on the principle of what would Albert do? It's such a nice way to start this heinous list. Number nine, Napoleonic Wars. Okay, a little bit of a stretch, but I would argue the Victorian era lasted from about 1814 to 1914. There's no specific date, but it could be classified around this time. The Napoleonic Wars were essentially world wars started by one man, the Corsican Ogre. Hello. Imagine having the whole world against you. No, really, the whole world. 
against you. Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, and sometimes Italy took part in the coalition wars, which were just part of Napoleon's story. Trust me, this dude was arrogant and he was the antagonist of this story. He's been labeled as the greatest tactician ever. When it was all said and done, he had rediscovered ancient Egypt, fought many battles, and managed to become emperor. And he got banished twice. Eight, mummy unwrapping parties. What is your favorite idea of a get together? Let me know down below, I won't judge, I promise. Unless of course you say mummy unwrapping parties like some people in the Victorian era might have. Then I will indeed judge you. Thanks to the Napoleonic Wars making their way to Egypt, interest in the country was on the up and up. And while people have been buying mummies since the Elizabethan era, now these rich weirdos bought even more, bringing them back as souvenirs. Once they got to the homestead, they would almost instantly hold parties with all their rich friends where they would unwrap their mummies like a Christmas present. Congratulations! It's exactly what you thought it would be! A five or six thousand year old decaying corpse that smells horrible. Why are rich people like this? I, I don't get it. Number 7. Fire Hazard Christmas like all families at Christmas, we all have our traditions. I'm a good boy all year, so Santa can bring me lots of gifts. Thanks, Santa. My family tradition is to watch the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation every year. I love that movie. Adam, on the other hand, well, he's a bad boy, and he eats all the chocolate out of his advent calendar before it's time. Don't tell him I said anything, though. No. I can't help it. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's right there. However, one family Christmas tradition was quite popular back in Victorian times, oftentimes called Snapdragon. Uh, the basis of this game was to get a large bowl, fill it with dad's brandy, and drop some large raisins in said bowl. Next, get a candle or a match and uh, light it up. Now that there's a large cauldron of flaming liquid and fireballs in your living room, now your objective is to try and knock the raisins out of the dish without getting burned. Fun for the whole family, why not? Just be mindful, you know, that the whole house is made of wood and there's no fire alarms and there's no modern firefighting equipment and everyone's wearing long gowns and you get the point. Number six, maybe we were apes? November 24th, 1859 marks the day that none other than Charles Darwin published the famous and even infamous On the Origin of Species, presenting his theory of natural selection and questioning the theory of creation. Truly a great day in my opinion. Look, we can talk evolution versus creation in the comments, but there is no denying the evidence presented in On the Origin of Species had people turning heads and questioning everything they thought they knew. Its full title, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life kind of explains it. But basically, Charles' book gave us the idea that species evolve over generations through the process of natural selection, which he backed up with evidence from the Beagle expedition in the 1830s, which to my disappointment had nothing to do with the dog breed beagles. Number five, the potato famine. The potato, so rugged, so versatile. Think of all the ways you can prepare a potato. Boiled, broiled, baked, mashed, pan fried, deep fried, french fries, hash browns, latkes, and sometimes you can put them in soup or stew. Usually pretty cheap and filling. The food of peasants and I love it. However, during 1845 Ireland, a fungus outbreak was taking hold of potato harvest all over the country, thus creating a large famine that would see over one million people perish in a famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was ineffective, and by help, I mean the same effort I put into reaching for the TV remote that's too far away on a lazy Sunday. Number 4, Body Snatching. Look, back in the day, making a buck was not so easy. Some people who had absolutely no morals went this route. Basically, you wait around for a recently vacant grave to be not vacant, and before the soil can settle, you remove the inhabitant of said grave and go to your local university and say, Right, I've got this here fresh non-mangled corpse, give me some money and it's all yours. And Bob's your uncle, you are now the very bottom of the barrel, detritus of human existence. But hey, you made some moolah and can afford to eat your next meal. Honestly, while you may be the worst of the worst people, it's partially the doctors and schools that are to blame for even accepting these fresh, illegally exhumed corpses for study in the first place. It may not sound like a specific event, but um, some people dressed up for it, so there's that. Number three, the Chew Bennett. 
The London Underground, baby, the world's first subway. Which, let me tell you, it's kind of annoying living in Canada when you have two very popular franchises that share two common names for a rapid underground train. Metro and Subway, right? It's so annoying. You Google Metro and Subway and then the grocery store comes? I never have that. Okay. It's, maybe it's a me thing. It's a me thing. Tunnels underneath the city and trains travel through it. It's simple. Well, the first one was opened in 1863, which is an engineering feat to say the least. And it feels like forever ago. I mean, that's older than Canada for crying out loud. When you think of the Victorian era, you think horses, carriages, top hats, and orphans asking for more gruel. Mind you, the locomotive was different from a modern one, but this is a very modern idea, especially considering that there's no cars yet. Kind of a weird thing. Number two, the telephone. On March 7th, 1876, Scotsman Alexander Graham Bell got a patent for his invention of the telephone. Three days after acquiring the patent, Mr. Bell made his first phone call to his assistant, Thomas A. Watson, saying, Watson, come here, I want to see ya. And that was that. And we've gone downhill ever since. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. The telephone is a huge groundbreaking invention allowing people to communicate across vast distances. But the phone addiction some of us have to deal with now, man, it's rough. Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and the whole reason he became interested in the idea of creating the telephone was because of his mother, who was deaf, and his father, Alexander Melville Bell, who was a teacher of elocution, and was famous for the phonetic transcription system he had developed to help the deaf learn to speak, which is really quite sweet, actually. Number one, the war to end all wars. Out of all my research about the Victorian era, the start was somewhat muddy. Maybe because historians don't want to take away from North American or Napoleon history. But the end of the Victorian era was more clear. 1914, the war to end all wars. This was the big one, folks. A mixture of militarism, imperialism, alliances, and a power struggle uh, made for a powder keg that ended up exploding in 1914. Unlike a lot of wars, this one actually changed things. Empires fell while others got stronger. Countries on maps were being redrawn. Others stayed the same. The culture? Well, it changed too. What did it? I'm not sure exactly, but what I do know is that when sitting in a wet, freezing, muddy trench for months on end, well, that's horrible, especially when the only thing you have to look at is a red paste that used to be your comrades. It was not a good time. And it made a lot of folks go a little, you know, a little crazy. 